and I watched the UFC fight. Do you like UFC? I don't really watch it very often. Uh, well, it says one of my favorite fighters retired after he lost. Yeah. It seems like a rough business. Yeah, another week or so and the Suns will play. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see, is this showing up? So you haven't recorded the participation for the walkthrough of your game yet? No. But, but I'm catching up. I'm still reading the third card. Okay. You heard a little bit of skies. So do I have to send you an email about it when I'm done? Just upload it. Because I said after the deadline passes, we won't be able to upload it. Yeah, I guess email that one. So here is Angelina. This is my third person game design. Um, this is the second installment, the second draft of the game. I just wanted to talk a little bit about my design process. The music's a little loud on the OBS, so um, there's the microphone you use to record OBS, and then. There is the sound coming from your computer. And so the sound coming from your computer is uh, here, most likely. Um, although scroll down and make sure there's not two of them there. And so, you know, I usually back this off a little bit so that we can hear the other one. But we can hear you. Maybe you start over here. Just to start with the Okay. Wait, wait, what are you talking about there? Uh, like, like a few years later, like a philosophical question, question in that sense, it is guarded, but also when I hit play here, um, it kind of like just grabs me on the other side. You know, kind of like to kind of get me thinking about maybe life a little more. And I need to kind of like 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 Okay. <clears throat> great, great, great. There's a lot of stuff going on here. Um, 
let's well let's keep going a little bit here so the this uh, watering can you're really maximizing what we've been doing in terms of the modeling there's a few things here I'm going to point out that may make a few things a bit easier or maybe a little bit more visually interesting but the 3d water drops is probably not the way to go there um, let's look at a way we could do that with um, with particles but not not quite like you have Okay, all right, because it's definitely more of a walk cycle than a run cycle here. Um, the Even so, the feet look a little slippy. I might turn up the um, animation speed on the walk cycle so that as the, if you don't, then when the character's foot is down on the ground, there's definitely points at which it's obviously sliding, which I think doesn't work as well as if the feet move a little too quickly. The they're swinging back and forth there, but I doesn't I didn't feel like they bounced you when they made contact, which um, seems like they probably should. But it's also, it is doable. Uh, I think something I would like to change is to maybe maybe my So all the camera jostling there is happening because of the Cinemachine script, right? We talked about that last time. Either disable the Cinemachine Collider or change the Cinemachine Collision settings. That, that's all on Monday stream. Robot here. I thought this was a nice way to incorporate it. And also kind of like, I wanted to leave it open so that way you wouldn't get knocked off all the time. Um, kind of like a little like a bridge here. So that way you can kind of like My favorite spot is this water slide. I feel like it's, 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 it's Yeah, I'm not a huge fan of that track. I mean, I, I like piano, trio, jazz, but I don't know if it works for what you're doing here. Um, in, you know, the form of that music is very um, open-ended, and uh, I don't know if it works quite well based on what, what's going on here. A few things modeling-wise, let's take care of first. Um, I think this one, sign here at the beginning. This is a shovel? That's what I got out of it? Is that what everybody else thought? Yeah? 
I mean, because of the gardening theme, it looked like a a shovel, I think. Um, to do the front part of a shovel, that would be a little bit different of a shape. So um, you could do that. Uh, let's see. Uh, by moving around some points. So I'm going to make a plane. I'm going to press NB. And then just make it uh, 2 by 2. And then I'm going to drop it into a subdivision surface. You'll see that that'll round it out like this. Um, and then I'm going to select the plane and hit C. So that allows me to grab the points on the plane. So for instance now, I can go into point mode, have the plane selected, and I could grab these points here in the middle of this and move those down. And you can see how that starts to create like a curved surface there. Um, and so a combination of moving the points, and then if you go into edge mode, maybe grabbing these two edges, if we want more length here, I go just control drag that edge and then maybe grab these points in the middle and move those down if we want to create more of a point on the front of the shovel we can grab the frontmost point here and move that forward and you see how that starts to make it into more of like a shovel kind of shape we could grab these and move them back to adjust. And so the subdivision surface does the smoothing on it, but you manipulate the points, edges, and polygons of the underlying part. Again, I could grab that point there, move that further forward. I could move these further back, just shift clicking both of them start to make more of like a shovel kind of zone there and then it is one polygon thick which is not exactly what we would want there so um, the way I would do that is perhaps come over here and look for I'm gonna press shift C actually shift C and look for cloth surface it's going to be the green one. And so let's grab that. We're not going to turn it into cloth. It's just that this object does a really nice trick. It allows you to add thickness to an object. And so if I dump the whole thing into the cloth and then dial up the thickness on this, probably past one, you can see it gives me two sides now. We don't need any subdivisions there. And so now I have something that will render in um, Unity, both sides of it. If you wanted to create the other part, I might do that as just a separate tube. And then, you know, since you're doing it all here, it could just be uh, another cylinder. You know, make this cylinder a child of the tube, and then press Alt Zero, which will align it perfectly with the tube. And then I can move it from there.
but we want it all to be um, we want to first make sure that the different parts had the different materials and then this part probably right so we have some sort of shovel I would put it all in a null with another alt G and uh, then call this shovel and then I would um, make sure that this connect objects give me one mesh that I can export as that but yeah it seems like most of the objects that were hitting you were just sort of moving you over to the side which looks, makes it look like there's not the the bump script is not happening there based on the character size I felt like it was pretty tight the whole time um, and so maybe some widening of the play area to give yourself a little more space would be a good idea but let's look at the um, water here yeah you don't want to use the, the 3d object for the water doesn't really work in this instance I think we'd want something simpler that flowed along the path so for instance We can still make it look like individual droplets of water, right? So we're not going to make it look like a flowing stream of water. There's a bunch of different issues you'd have there with that. But we could do droplets of water that would at least splash when they hit the ground. And so let's make a sprite for our water droplet rather than the sphere and the cone. In this case, I'm going to go to film and video and then just make it um, like 250 by 250. It's going to be enough and make sure it's set to transparent. Where is my mouse? There we go. Okay, so you have the right idea of starting with a circle and then I'll just go into A for anchor point mode so I can grab a single anchor point and pull that up and then grab the handles on said anchor point what it is in Illustrator to break the handles. Alt. Each program has a different key for this. It's Alt in Illustrator. So that allows me to grab the handles individually to create a water drop that has a little bit more of some curvature to it. And we don't want any stroke on this. So we'll say zero there. And when we make a particle, you don't want it to be white. 
you want it to be uh, about 50% gray. That way you can make it brighter if you need to or darker if you need to. It's just a more flexible workflow. Okay, so now we have our own sprite for the water drops. And we don't bring in an Illustrator file. We need to bring in a PNG. So we need to export this as a PNG. And let's look at a particle system here. I'm going to go to my particles scene. And make a new particle system. Okay, there we go. And when you go to emission shape, it uh, you can see the cone there of how it's working by default, the cone shape. And so we'll point this a little bit more like that. And you can see how this is working, but it needs to these need to essentially pour out and fall down, right? And so they need to have gravity. There's the gravity modifier up here top. If you turn that up, you see that. OK, now we're much closer to what we would want there. There's the start speed, sort of how quickly they would move out. If we turn up the gravity multi multiplier, there we go. It's another kind of falling out of there. And maybe the start speed a little bit higher. And they probably don't need to live this long, maybe just three seconds. OK, that gives us at least more along the motion that we're looking for. Right, So a dense bunch of particles starts to look like a stream, especially in this case, of like stream of sprayed water. So we're close there. Now let's bring in our sprite. And so I'll grab the sprite that we just made. A water drop and bring that in. And again, we got to set it as a sprite and apply. Then it'll be transparent. It's much better. And we make, need to make a new material. And this will be our water drop. And water drop needs to be universal render pipeline particles, probably unlit. Unlit means it's just going to have a color regardless of the lighting. So we're for a simpler sort of system. There we go. We need to want we want this particle system here, which we will call um, uh, we'll call it uh, watering can. There we go. And for watering can we need to come down to render and tell it not to use the default material, but use our new one that we just made called water drop. There we go. Now it's just white, but uh, let's go ahead and edit water drop. And so the base map on water drop needs to become our sprite that we just brought in. Okay, so a little bit better, right? We're seeing what's going on there. Although I can tell we're gonna have a problem. Is there a way to fix this on? No, let's re-export. Uh, the thing I didn't do here that I should have done is export as a PNG and tell it to use all the art, use the artboard so that we do get a square texture because the particles are square by default and so this will be the new water drop square. There we go. We'll export that and say okay. There we go. That already looks better. And now, as we wait for Illustrator to make a PNG file, um, here it is.
change this to Sprite. Ugh, that's not it. Oh my lord, Illustrator, what are you doing? Just save a PNG, please. Export. Just artboard one. Water drop. Um, what is going on here? This is the, that looks good. Okay, did it happen this time? I think so. Let me get rid of all of these wrong ones. It may have just been taking a second to update. Add that to the material. We come back to our watering can. There we go. All right, so now it's not cut off at least. That's better. Um, let's fix the material a little bit more in that we want Is that really distorted? Drive me insane. Looks fine here. Looks fine there. It's 250 by 250. We'll make another material from scratch. Try and take my own advice here. Don't try and fix it, just do the thing again. Probably some box got checked, water drop material. Water drop material needs to be universal render pipeline, particles, unlit, there we go. Now we'll provide this. Still distorted here. Crazy me. I don't know. We'll get to the bottom of it here in a second. We've got enough to get started. Um, we don't want the white, right? We want it to be transparent. So uh, we want it to not be opaque. We want it to be transparent. That does the first part for us, right? So now we have that. Since it's gray, we can uh, change it to whatever color we would want. For our water drops, Um, okay, so they're blue now, and then one of the last things to get us going here is that we do, right now they all face exactly down, which doesn't look right. We want the water drops to sort of face in the direction that they're going, and we can do that in the particle system in rendering, I believe.
render alignment. Right now it's set to view world velocity. Velocity just gives us that. That's not exactly what we want. Let's say don't allow roll. I'm going to make them a little bit brighter so it's easier to see what's going on. Let's go ahead and go over material, sorting mode, particle size. We are facing the right direction. And if we look at the way they're facing here, um, we get these kind of interfaces in Unity occasionally where it's X, Y, Z and this is kind of like rotating um, the underlying pivot here. And so for instance Z, if I put it at 1, No, we're still not going in the direction that we want. We've got the motion that we want on the particles, but not the overall line. Okay, so switching to mesh, and let's go to plane here. I think we did this with the leaves for somebody, if I remember correctly. Now we're getting somewhere. So here's what I've got right now. Mesh plane water drop material. These are, that is checked, but everything else is set to zero. Uh, our scale here is a little too big, right? And so we can come back here to our size. You probably want some, some you know, uh, variety there. So our start size, I'm going to say random between two constants and say maybe 0.1 and 0.3, there we go. Cool, now we're actually facing the direction that we wanna go. If this was against another background, we would see that. Let me just put something back there. Cool, so we've got, st I think this, you know, now they face the right direction. They are out towards us. Let's see, is there any way to get them to totally always 
rotate on the one axis towards us. Because we've got mesh uniform, mesh distribution random, sort mode, particle alignment. I like that. That's good. If they went out, if we had more of a varying speed here at the beginning, I think we might see more of a field of them. So over here under start speed, let's go ahead and give it a random between two constants. So maybe 18 and 40. There we go. All right, so now we're spraying that. We could have it. Um, you could turn it on and off with the with the animation of your watering can, right? So as your watering can tips over, you could animate the rate over time down from zero to one, um, or you could give it its um, you could say curve, and so that would give you a animation curve that you could use to control the watering can water. So it sort of makes some water and then stop. So it spikes more and then stops, makes some more and then stops. We would want it to splash a little bit. We could do that with some bounce, for instance. Right, so it's uh, watering onto there. And how would you make it bounce? You got to come in here to ch -ch 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 watering can and collision. So we turn on collision and we want, by default, it's a plane to make it very inexpensive. You can change it to world and you see the bounces off there. Like that's obviously way too bouncy and I believe our yeah our bounce is set to 1 if we set it to like 0 0.01 we want a little bit more than that maybe 0.1 how about 0.3 alright so now the water bounces off of one onto the other. They still live way too long. So duration, maybe just one. Or not duration, sorry. Duration is the total length of time. Our lifetime, two. And that's going to give us something that looks way more like water. We could have it definitely be denser. You could right click on here and say edit key. This is the one that controls the birth rate. And so the value here could be much greater. What else do we have in our collision? We have our bounce, lifetime loss. Instead of colliding with um, colliders, you can make it just uh, collide with a plane. If you go to plane, you can set the plane that it collides with. Let's see here. Oh, because uh, this would be cheaper than using uh, colliders. Colliders would essentially work with every object, but they're going to be way more expensive, right? If I had this set to colliders it would bounce somewhat from one to the next or to world rather right so it bounces off one goes on the other one but if I set it to plane then you have to feed it a plane because planes obviously would be less math right it's just a flat surface but if I were to do something like this 
and make this bigger. Uh, but then tell the watering can that in the collision parameter, we want to collide with this plane. There we go. Let's have it bounce more than that now. Planes, solid. And to avoid it bouncing twice, you could say lifetime loss. Lifetime loss at one means that they're just vaporized the instant that they hit the plane. A lifetime loss at zero means that they live their full lifetime. If you make a lifetime loss somewhere around like 0.8 or maybe 0.5, we at least get them bouncing off kind of like a splash of water would happen. And the other thing you could do here is just have them get smaller at the end of their lives. right? So if we had this here, I want them to be even denser. So we'll go to emission. I'm just going to turn it back to a constant for now. Right, so they just kind of disintegrate, or they just blip out of existence. But we have a, we have a module for that, scale over lifetime. And so if I were to turn that on and come in here, um, here they start, this is, the, you know, this is their lifetime. They're born and they're super small and they grow bigger and they're small, they're big at the end. That's the opposite of what we want. We want them to be bigger at the beginning. And so they give you these convenient presets down here for these kind of graphs. And so like, okay, this is actually, this is probably gonna be a better graph for us. So we start bigger and then it kind of splashes or smaller at the end. Maybe I control click in here to make another point to move it a little bit more so they stay bigger longer. More like that. Cool. But if you have it set to collision you know, world, it's going to, um, even the moving things should collide with it. Can I have them both selected at the same time? I think it's going to move both of them. But that's way better. And I think that would even work on the water slide. Um, in that, you know, it would be drops of water animating down the slide. That's a good one. I haven't had anyone do that kind of thing before with a water slide like that. Let's see, just real quickly. All right, so need a new water slide element here. David, what kind of object do I need to make in Cinema 4D to make a water slide? We need a, a spline's one of them. John? Sweep, yeah, sweep. And then let's go ahead and bring it in as a We'll sweep a, the arc is easy to use because it has a um, function on it that allows you to sort of make it whole. So if we do that and then grab our sweep, put both of those on there, like so, like so, like so, there we go. And then in the sweep itself, or in the arc rather, you can sort of control the radius down. You can switch it from arc to 
ring yeah ring and then that allows you to you know, sort of make a two-sided slide and you can sort of control each part you have to go negative there with that to get that there we go water slide probably not as many points especially because we are going to use this as a you have to use a mesh collider here okay let's see if this how this works with the particles I would be interested and so we'll take this as an FBX and this is our water slide and bring it in here there it is let's say 444 four, four. that seems about right move it to where it would need to be bigger okay let's get rid of these two things and uh, by default it does a mesh is not going to come in with its own collider and so we'll need to give it the mesh collider and I think you're going to need to say that this well let's see what it does here if I move this down a little bit I don't want them to spray out quite so much in the particle system in the watering can particle system because we're still in the cone shape the angle here is how wide is the nozzle right so that makes it wider and if I make it much narrower there we get more of a stream and we can see that we are colliding with some things let's make our lifetime a little bit longer pretty water slide ish just there by itself let's they need to live longer now <laughs> lifetime five and some of them are definitely making contact and let's make their size smaller 0 0.05 and 0.1 What if, so the thing I did before to have them splash was the collision bounce. What? Because before they were kind of sliding on the surface, which is kind of what we want now. And so if we want to collision bounce zero,
We definitely get some water splashing, but this is pretty good. I don't know why so many go through here at the end. Is it because they can't bounce twice? And their collision bounces zero. Collision quality high. Yeah, convex, it's not figuring out there. So, I mean, that's pretty good. Uh, the, I mean, as far as, you know, a lot closer. The, a couple ways, so once you start to getting into physics-y stuff like this, you know, trying to cheat the system so that it works correctly uh, can be just sort of like insane making. So there's a couple different things you could do. Um, is like maybe there's multiple water sprayers in the slide and so there's like one there and then we'll hit uh, duplicate and now there's another one you know down here and so that there's two uh, producing water there like that would fill it in well enough the, um, the other thing that you could do is Maybe use multiple colliders on this. Let's double check and make sure the mesh looks correct over here. If we hit C on this and grab all the polygons, are the normals facing the right direction? They are. Unity used to give you a view of what's going on with the collider. It does when we hit convex, but that's just not, it's trying to close the shape. Anyways, that's much closer. And now we've got, you know, something that looks, you know, not like real water, but like stylized water that I think works with your game here, instead of, you know, the snow cone looking because these don't look like water droplets, especially when they like roll around and everything. That's not quite, quite what, what you would want there. But I think the bounce part of it needs to go in there and really tune the bounce. You've got a new shovel to put in there. The tree design works with the level design, I think. That works pretty well. I don't quite know what's happening here with this blue wall. Maybe there's particles there, but yeah, it seemed like a lot of the obstacles wouldn't really push, really didn't bounce you out of the way, which from a gameplay standpoint was a little strange. What if this was just much, much wider? Yeah, a lot more of them catch there. To make sure they don't go through, if you just automatically got rid of them on the slide, so that would be their lifetime loss at one. Yeah, so the size here definitely matters a little bit. Cool. Okay. That was fun. We got some cool, good ideas there for the whole thing. Okay, the other thing is that we got to talk about, we're going to add some title screen here and some uh, interface design for this one, which we've got to get going.
And yeah, I talked to, who did I talk to about this? Um, someone else in the class. I'm not a big fan of this type of thing because it doesn't really look like grass. Um, it just kind of looks like you slapped a texture onto a flat thing. Yeah, I guess kind of looks like leaves here a little bit. Um, I'm not I'm sure if you have it on the both channels. Like maybe if you had a more stylized set of leaves there, it would look a little bit better. I think maybe a different color for the eyes, certainly. This has like a kind of like a Dr. Seuss kind of look to it, um, which I think works. But yeah, some um, more stylized set of leaves, look of, of leaves there. Um, I'll come back to that. Let's look at some of the other ones first and then come back to it. Where is... So, yeah, what, because um, I think Janelle was doing this before. So, to see how Janelle sort of replaced what used to be like a really flat green texture that was on the trees with, you know, is this, does this look like leaves? No. But does it look, make it look much richer, right? It's like a thing where it's not just this default, completely flat thing coming from, um, you know, of your standard materials. So something like this would serve you better, Angelina, on your your design. Okay, so, so same thing here. Again, on OBS, guys. Um, this you've got the the portal here, right? You've got to turn this down slightly so that we can hear the the microphone just a little bit better. We can make it out just barely. Okay, so this is definitely better. I remember this used to just be a wall and having it be a fence, a moving fence, I think fits the theme better. The run and jump look pretty good, as does the idle. Yeah, this is a really great application of the swinging obstacle dog bones. Super modelable in the volume builder. Uh, 
it doesn't look like they actually get low enough to hit the character. Yeah, the tennis ball idea is awesome, but this is just too... For as big as they get on screen, this is just too low res, right? So now that we've done some more 3D, right, either the closer or the larger that the 3D mesh is on screen, it's going to need more, more resolution for the uh, textures. So your tennis ball there is just not quite enough. Um, let's see. Drawing that just right. I mean, wasn't that on Texture Haven? I seem to remember that. just the baseball and then deflated football and or soccer ball um, let's see what we can find tennis ball texture it's got to be mapped correctly or at least I'm um, projected correctly yeah I'm trying to think about what that would look like When you're searching, like I said, this one needs to be larger so you can narrow it down by size. You still have specific numbers there. Um, is there one in cinema? Oh, yeah. So there's one in the asset browser. If we open that one up. Cool. It's got a texture here. Let's bring it in and look at it at least. Where is it? Yeah, so the stuff in, this, in the cinema... Um, Asset browser is modeled to scale. Yeah, this is the one you got. Okay, so we've got a situation here where this is just not um, quite enough, right? If we were to zoom in, like it fills up about this side of the screen, that's a little soft. Although, um, part of it is that I think in yours, you're not using the normal channel. That's definitely part of it. So let's. Let's bring that in. Let's make sure it's not. OK, so yeah, we definitely would want to bring this object in. We don't want to just throw this material on another ball because the ball that is in Unity, the default sphere, does a different topology. The layout of the sphere is different, right? It looks the default sphere, and the default sphere in 99% of programs looks like zoom out like this a polar arrangement of um, polygons whereas the tennis ball is what's referred to as I forget hexahedron yeah hexahedron which is more like it just a like a plumpy cube right because you can see that there's a top side side layout in the whole thing um, so we've got this, I'm going to right click on this and let's look at this real quick. It's got color, 
Reflectance and bump. It's got a separate bump map. Okay, how do I get these textures? Um, I'm going to file export selected object as FBX. Actually, yeah, let's try that. And let's bring it in over here and see what we get. Cool. So we got tennis ball. But didn't come in with the textures. Sometimes, let's try it one other way. I'm going to right click and export object as OBJ and say that we want to consolidate textures in the material and say OK. And then set a tennis ball. I think that might work better. Let's see. There it is. Tennis ball OBJ, if I bring this in. And then there's a separate MTL file, which I think I can bring in. No, let's not bring that in. Yeah, all of this is checked. Materials, bake materials, we say OK. No. Okay, we can get around it. Uh, I'm going to tell this file to save project with assets. So save project with assets. Let's make a new folder here. This is tennis C4D. And I will double click. And when I do that, There we go. I just had a, a you sh shouldn't have that error that I just got. And so, let's come back here. Let's go to tennis C4D. Uh, where did I save it to? File, save project uh,
Save project with assets. Ah. Why is it even looking for this sky? It's not even in the file. Um. Let's try one more thing. Uh, we will come in here and object, bake object. And we will make the textures 1024 by 1024. We'll make them PNGs. And We'll put it into that same folder. And say bake. There we go. So now if I look in that folder, hopefully. Cool, here's our textures. So let's go ahead and, since we have this separately now, we can bring them in over here. So we'll bring that in and bring this in. And we don't need a bunch of tennis ball meshes. We just need the one. There it is. It needs a material. And let's throw the material on there. Now this material, we should be able to put this in there. That's good. So that gets us where some part. Now for the other parts, uh, we have these scratches here, which we could use perhaps Right, so it's still not quite high res enough. We put the scratches, the smoothness here, onto here. That doesn't really do it for us either, because that's sort of just being mapped onto the metallic part. I'm gonna get rid of that, just say no. Um, it'd be great if we could sort of make a normal map out of this map. And so we can do that with a shader graph. I'm going to make a new shader graph and I'll say lit and I'll call this tennis and then I'll switch my tennis material from universal render pipeline to shader graph tennis, the one we just made. And then let's open up Tennis, which is here. And you can just drag textures directly in here. So I can just drag this in. Let's make sure that Tennis is on there. There we go. And so now 
um, just like you drag the picture onto the color channel, this is the picture here. And so this is the output, RGBA. It's a four, this is what's referred to as a vector four, in that there's four numbers together. And if we just run it into the color and save, we should see that. Now, we want normal map, but this is not a normal map. Um, but we kind of want to just make the bumps based on the color. So there is a node for that. Create node. Uh, we're going to call normal. And then there's one called normal from height. And so that's going to take an input image and create a normal map out of it. You can tell it's a normal map because it's the signature normal map blue. Let's run that into the normal. And no change, right? Why is there no change? Because we're making a shader piece of shader code here. And so we need to save. There we go. So now we're getting the bump on this, but it's way too strong. Over here, we see that the uh, strength can be dialed in and out. And is it way too strong or way too weak? Let's see. Let's make it. Point uh, zero zero one, and save. There we go. Right now, at least we're getting that. It looks too shiny, but we can adjust that right here with the smoothness. Uh, we don't want that to be one. One is going to be super shiny. We want it to be uh, probably like almost po almost zero, maybe just point 0.1. Cool. Okay, so now that gives us a better look for our tennis ball. Although if I'm being really picky, the white looks like it's coming out here. So we might be able to get away with one more node. How do I turn white into black? What effect does that? Invert, yep. Yeah, anytime you're in one of these environments with effects or anything like that, there is almost certainly an invert node, invert colors. And so we want to invert the yellow into here. And now instead of feeding that into here, uh, we got to, you have to say, yeah, invert all of them. There we go. And now run that into there, right? So now the chain goes from picture to invert to normal, and then save asset. There we go, right? See how that worked? Now the, the line goes in, as you would expect on a tennis ball. How big is this image? Um, if you grab it over here, 512 by How do we get more resolution? A couple different things we could do. Uh, one is that we could up-res this in any number of scenarios. So most, pro you know, every Adobe program now has 
some sort of quote unquote AI driven up res. Because we couldn't just go find another tennis ball image because it may not line up with the UV map that is on that tennis ball mesh that we have here. And so let's open come on Photoshop how about just open a file. And we want to change image size. In pixels, so if you leave it locked, let's say it's twenty forty eight now, and it is resampling. That means it's you know trying to add more detail there um, or preserving it. And we can say okay. Now we have a larger image. Now we can export this as a PNG. So this wouldn't work in every case, but this isn't like the world's most complicated image, right? And it's mostly just tennis fuzz, so we're probably going to be able to get away with it here. I am going to, well no, we're not going to be able to A-B test it, we'll just bring in the other one. Uh, downloads. Tennis high res. I don't know why we got stretched there. Let's see what's going on. Um, and if we were to bring this in and replace our feed here, well, first of all, let's just replace it one channel at a time. And so here's our high res one. If we dump that into the base color and save, a little bit better. And let's dump it into the normal field and save. Cool. That's definitely better. Point zero 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 one. Right, so now that at least gives us more details. You look at it, 
This number does have to be super low given this particular setup. I think that has something to do with the color space, but let's not worry about it for right now. 0 0.0001. Let's make sure we're getting all of our pixels on our image. So make sure that that, if your image is high res, but this max size is set to a number below that, you're still not getting all of the images that you would need there. Let's save that again, save this asset. Cool. Very close. Yeah, so the Photoshop route here is the way to go. Upres, the one that we've got. Okay, so over here, this setup here, they all move together. You made one that slides back and forth. Uh, the animation speed script is going to throw that on each one so that then they are not exactly the same. They kind of move back and forth at slightly different speeds. Cool. So the, the, the particles you got going on here, uh, something strange, something in the material, right? So if we want these to look like energy or just sparkles or something like that, these need to be in add blend mode. That is not in the particle system. It's in the material uh, that does that. So again, over here,
Right. The reason this looks like it's hot here is because of the material. Renderer particle. Where is this material? Here we go. All right. And right here, particle blending mode additive, right? I think yours is probably still in alpha, right? Which means that it's blended according to the alpha channel, which means that as it fades out, it gets darker, which doesn't you know, work at all there. We want, as the particles pile up, right? Because the particles are just, you can, you can conceptually think of each particle as a separate Photoshop layer, right? And every Photoshop layer can have its own blend mode. And here, we want to set the blend mode for all of these particles to, okay, not color mode, blend mode to additive. Right, that's going to actually add them together there. And then also, I would really encourage you to come up with a different um, particle, even if it's just slightly different, like we did with the snowflake, right? If I were to drag that in there, we have that happening. Or the water drop. Right, so where they are more dense, you know, it gets added together and they get much, much, much brighter. Right, you've got to go in and, and change that on the material. It's separate from the particle system there. Now, confetti, I think, yeah, because it's unclear what those particles are for. I mean, they don't really look like anything in particular, right? And when you win the race or something like that, confetti would seem to be uh, perhaps the better play there. Do we do an explosion? We did the beginning. We'll do one more. Okay, so they need to look like pieces of confetti. I mean, I suppose the easiest way to get that is render, um, we just make a new material that's just gonna be blank. So universal render pipeline, particles, lit, and that's it. So where is this? I didn't change the name of it yet, so it's just new material. Got to organize my example project here. All right, so confetti is just going to be white. And so now in this one here, which I'll call confetti. So this could be for a lot of you. I know I think this would work in um, Stephanie's game as well. All the games when you win, it might be fun to do this in your color palette. So that would make it a little bit more individual that rather than everyone using the same confetti. But if I were to drag this in there, there we go. Now I just have white particles. How do I make them all sorts of fun colors? I come up here to the start color and I have my options of gradient, random between two colors, random between two gradients, um, gradient is going to be what we want here in that this is not going to change over the course of their lifetime. I'm going to click on it now if I were to change this one to red. We'll get them sort of just randomly choosing colors over the course of their lifetime here. They kind of go from one to the other over five seconds. Let's go and try random color. Random color just randomly selects something from the gradient, right? So that we get some along the gradient. How can we dial this in so it's like in a color palette? 
we put just put the color palette in our gradient. And so for instance, I'm gonna have, let's say my, my color palette here, this will be a July 4th celebration of the red, white, and blue, right? And so they're kinda, but we get all these pastels, right? That are like in between. How do we get, get rid of that? Sometimes a gradient, you don't want it to actually blend. You want it to go fixed. Now, I get just get those colors, right? And if I wanted like a little bit of gold in there, I could add another one and do that. And now I'll just get, you know, the visual ratio here controls the probability of having that color. And so now I can have, you know, confetti that's specific to my um, game, but this doesn't look like confetti. We want it to blow up and go all over the place. Um, and so we want to spew way more particles. Let's say 100. They need to have gravity. So I'm going to put my gravity modifier at maybe 5, maybe 2. And they need to go up faster, right? So there's a bounce between the gravity's force and then the start speed. So start speed, I'll say random between two constants. Let's put it at like maybe 30 and 100. 30 and 50. There we go. All right, now we're getting somewhere. We're definitely spewing confetti, but it it's doing what we usually want particles to do, and that's look 3D. But it's tricking us into looking 3D because it just rotates towards the camera all the time, right? And we don't want that because we actually want them to look like little pieces of paper. So back down to that renderer. Instead of billboard, we want mesh. That's part of the way there. And then we want to randomize the starting rotation. So 3D start rotation. And I can just say random between two constants. So between 0 and 360 in every direction. Oh, we have a cube right now. We don't want a cube, we want a plane. Or even just a quad. A quad is just one polygon, so that's the fastest. That's pretty good, um, but we're only actually seeing half of them. This is that normal issue where we're only seeing, it's only rendering one side. So you gotta go back to the per confetti and render face by default, don't render the inside of stuff because that's just a waste of time. But in this case, we do want both. There we go. Now we see both of, of those. Cool. So now they're going off a different, um, that's you know way better. It could be different sizes. So start size. Again, we could come in here to random between two constants, maybe 0.1 and 1. There we go. And again, it's a confetti cannon. So here, yeah, to make it seem like a confetti cannon, which is kind of like psh, psh, that kind of thing, let's make the duration like 4. But then under rate over time, I'll go to a curve, which will allow me to make a like a sustained burst pretty easily that will turn on and off if we wanted these to accumulate on the ground we would need to put the collision on them which might be cool when you win the race um, the Go ahead and come down here and add collision with the world. A bounce, we don't want that. Bounce zero. It's actually below the surface, so they're all just getting smashed there. There we go. But they're sliding like crazy. And so dampen one.
Mm, now it's like they're throwing stars that are stuck to the ground there. Dampen, bounce. Maybe the dampen isn't totally one. What if it's like 0.9? I'll have to think about that one. That's not obvious to me. How we get them to make sure they land flat. Maybe maybe they need just a little bit of bounce. There we go. That's close. They're not rotating over the course of their life. There's one more we could do there. Rotation over lifetime. Turning that on, that's kind of like a uh, separate axis and random between two constants. So, you know, just for things flipping around all over the place, just setting the minimum to zero and the maximum to 360 sort of gives you all the options. When you use a curve like this, this is the max for the curve. The curve is normalized. These points will be at 1. But if I make this number bigger, like 500, then I'll get more confetti. There we go. Now that at least they wobble around enough, I think that's probably fine. Again, in the game, they won't. Um, um, And you know, when they hit the ground, they can go away faster. So collision, lifetime loss, 0.9. Mm, lifetime loss, 0.5. There we go. Right, because that idea, like they have to lay flat when they hit the ground, that might be. Because the collision here is pretty cheap. It's super cheap, right? It's not nearly as robust as like the physics system. It's really just calculating a point. And then that's why the, like, why doesn't it just lay flat? Because it's not really calculating the, the, the size of the quad. It's just calculating a point that gets there, right? And so uh, an oblique strategy here to, to make that work. But this, you know, it looks like a party, right? You could have a, just a bunch of these going off. If you had to make them different, would be to give them slightly different durations. So prime numbers are your friends here, because that means that they would not repeat in an obvious fashion. Right? If you make it like two, four, and six, they're going to line up. But if we make it like five, seven, and you know, it doesn't have to be a whole number. We could make it you know, three point one four or something like that. And then now, if I grab all three, they should have. It seems like a more random explosion and yeah I mean even that is not going to be Crazy? That should be able to run on most people's computers. Like, I don't think that's going to be insane, uh, the amount of it there. Because, remember, they, the particle systems do have that governor on it, right? And so it's not going to let there be 
more than a thousand particles in the system at any one time, right? It'll just shut itself off. Um, and so we have five of them, so we don't have any more than 5,000 particles there. And the particles are simulated slightly differently, so. Cool. Yeah, it's looking really good. Again, like I feel like the visual thing is getting pretty dialed in, but the per gameplay progression here, I think, could be changed a little bit um, in terms of making it more interactive um, and uh, going faster. So let's go ahead and do this. The game. Um, We, we, I think we have a pretty good system set up with the interactivity of the game, right? We have to complete the level within a certain amount of, well, we have to complete the level and, you know, faster is better because it's a, it's a race or whatever. But um, we might be um, better off here thinking about it a little bit differently, right? Because we did reset the game in different instances um, for falling off the falling off the world, something like that. The other thing that we could possibly take into account here is um, thinking about what if we have to do it within a certain amount of time. And if we look at our gameplay object right now, Let's look at this one. So we have a race timer. So the possible way to take care of this would be that instead of counting up to give you a time, would be to set a max time, right? You've got to complete the course within such and such amount of time. Um, and right now, we have a variable that represents the amount of time in the game, and essentially we just add to it as the game goes on, right? That tells us how much time that we've been in the game. Um, that's not the right script. Race timer. Edit now that that's open. There we go. Cool. So at the top, which dictionaries are we using? The usual, but this talks to a user interface element, so it needs to have that text mesh pro up there if you're going to talk to any of the text mesh objects. And so how does this work? Um, we've got the amount of time on the timer, and then we have a variable for minutes and seconds for the formatting of it because uh, the formatting of it is not um, necessarily obvious. So here, uh, timer time, this uh, may not be obvious to every, everyone. Plus equals me is the shorthand syntax for, um, let's say the timer time is 10 seconds, okay? Um, that's that valuable right there, variable value right there. Uh, if I were to rewrite this, it would be timer time, which is 10 seconds, equals 10 plus whatever delta time is. Delta time is the amount of time that's elapsed since the last frame. Okay, so this, this may seem strange at first, 
but the difference between Unity and you know C4D or After Effects, what frame rate do we always run Cinema 4D and After Effects at? Brandon, do you remember? All of our projects, we did what frame rate? Twenty-four. Twenty-four is what we... Yeah. Yeah, 24 frames per second. Yes, you remember that, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 24 FPS. Unity, ideally, we want games to run at 60 FPS. That's sort of the industry standard. That's enough frames that the input feels responsive enough for regular people, right? For competitive game situations, maybe you need more but that's usually enough. However, the reality is the frame rate in Unity is variable. It changes, right? Um, you've experienced this when playing a video game, right? You all of a sudden, you know, you get to some part and maybe it's not totally optimized and there's like an enemy spawner spawning a whole bunch of enemies and then the frame rate visibly starts to drop, right? And then you get on the internet and you complain about it right away on some forum or on Reddit, right? right away, immediately, you gotta get on there and immediately complain about it. Um, at least that's, you know, as someone who like, like I'm, I'm like just getting to middle school age when like Nintendo Entertainment System comes out. And like, and so I get to like see the video games as they happen. Um, and so like as people get so worked up about them today. You know, like I like, I enjoy playing games, but like, the degree to which uh, people really get worked up about them is always confusing to me. But um, Unity is, we don't know how much time has elapsed, which is why we need this variable here, delta time, right? It, Unity is looking at like, uh, I rendered a frame, now I'm rendering another frame, and the computer keeps track of a real world clock like that stays consistent regardless of what's going on. Right? And so it compares that clock time to the clock time when the next frame got spit out and then adds that amount of time. What does that do? It keeps, uh, it keeps, it allows you to calculate real world time consistently, right? Based on frames. Because we, we aren't doing the code based on real world time. For a void update runs uh, once every frame. Which, you know, because the whole world of video games is built on frames. Like, one frame, then we draw the next one, then we draw the next one. Um, but if we don't really know how long it is between frames, then you need things like this that allow us to access the real world time that's elapsed so that, um, so that the game doesn't change speed based on frame rate, right? If we didn't have this kind of thing in there, we would have a situation where if the game ran at 60 frames per second, it would be faster. Like everything would be faster. The player movement would be faster. The enemies would move faster than if something was normalizing it like this. So that's what's going on here. I should really just write this in a note here. This is um, calculate time independent depend dent of frame rate. Um, but we want to do something different now. We want to count down, right? And so if we want to count down, instead of plus equals, the, op the other shorthand for this is minus equals. That's a decrement, right? So this is increment and this is a decrement. Um, and, but we don't want to start off at zero. We want to start off uh, with a certain amount of seconds. And so to just test this out, I'm going to start it at 10, to start at 10 seconds. And then over the course of this, we will subtract every, every, once we start the game, right? Because this is, again, the start timer, meaning like we've crossed the starting line. Um, now we will subtract time and send it uh, to where it should go. Cool, let's just test that. 
Uh, I think I still have my starting timer object in here. So my game has like a million things in it. Yeah, starting line. Let me move that closer so it's easy to trigger. And I'll hit play. Um, and when I hit when the game starts, we should see. Yeah, we had 10 seconds on the clock, and then uh, I forgot I tested. I'm testing everything at the same time. I tested the moving platform there, which means that uh, we're just going to turn that off for a second. There we go. Okay. And so now, yeah, we saw 10 seconds go onto the clock at the beginning. Got to look over here while I'm. There we go. And it's counting down. So now, counts down, okay, but then we go to negative, that's not great, right? But um, what do we want to have happen if the timer reaches zero? You lose, right, yeah, we, got, yeah, we already have the stuff in place for, for losing the game, right? If you fall off or get bumped off or that kind of stuff. Um, and how, how have we been communicating between scripts? What's that mechanism called? A unity, a unity what? Close, close. The trigger is the, the point in space that allows us to start something. What's this? It's, a, it's an event. These are all unity events, right? This is how we've been sending things from one place to another. And so we need to be able to send an event when we run out of time. And so we need to do that. Um, if we look at bump player, in order to send Unity events, we need to add the event library. It's not a library. Um, it's a dictionary. No. Uh, never mind. I forget which one it is. You have to have this up there at the top. So where is my race timer? Here we go. There we go. Now I can use Unity events. Now um, let's look at the model here for making an event, right? So at the we need to make it a public event, right? And so public means that it's going to show up in the editor. Unity event is what type of thing is it? And then this is the name of the event. Right? And so we'll use that format over here. And so we need to make a public um, unity event. This is where the autocomplete is super helpful. Um, you know, it's more than just autocomplete. Microsoft calls it IntelliSense, um, something like that, um, where it, it's, only, it's showing you things that the computer is going to understand. And it also keeps you from misspelling them. Um, so, you know, it says it, it's just super, super helpful as you're doing this. It makes it very easy to sort of see where things are going wrong. And so we'll call this um, time out event, right? So that um, we know that we run out of time. And how do we actually call the event? It is I'm looking at the wrong thing. Here. All right, so this syntax, this is a little syntaxy here. You have the name of the event. This question mark is like an insurance policy saying that if this event doesn't exist, then move on. Just don't 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 you know just simply proceed with the game. Because uh, this, you run into this often with the code. Like if you ask the computer, "Hey, hey, go find this thing," and then if it can't find it, uh, yeah, it it, well, it just keeps looking, right? And the game freezes. Like I can't find it. Yeah. 
Um, and so that uh, allows that to happen. So we'll grab this. I'll just copy this here and put this into my race timer. And when do we want that to happen? Yep, exactly, right? And so we have a variable for the timer time. And so I'm going to write a statement here. If timer time is uh, less than or equal to zero, right? A little bit of insurance policy there, like it may not take a whole step and like the chances of it hitting exactly zero, right? So you don't want to say equal to zero. You just want to say less than or equal to zero. Um, zero F, then um, we want to send our unity event. And ours is not called on press event, it's called time out event. And we can invoke that event. And so uh, let's save. And now back at race timer. Here we go. Now our script has an event, right? And so here we can do all the things. We can turn on our lose message, right? So I think I have a placeholder in here. Let's see. Um, yeah, fall and lose. And so on my race timer now, uh, I will say that uh, this message should appear. Yeah, we just need to turn this on. So uh, game object uh, set active. Uh, set active, yes, we need to become active at that point. And so now, if let's save and test. And so in the game, we did this on Monday. Stephanie put this in her game already, where we started at the top and then used Cinemachine to come over to the other one. There we go. I started, I'm running around. Try again. Cool. OK, so we get our lose message there. Uh, we still are displaying the time. That is just going to look janky. We could go through a whole bunch of formatting rigmarole to figure out how to reformat it once we hit 0. Or what else can we do once we hit 0? Yeah, just deactivate the clock. Just don't, don't show me the clock anymore, right? So that, that can be part of our same event, hence the power of unity events. So uh, finish line or timer, race timer, timer. Uh, add another event here. And so the um, time, we will just simply, um, well, let's try turning it off. That may throw an error. We may just have to turn off the display of it, but we'll see. Set active, false. OK, and so let's try it again. I don't think that'll send an error. We'll see. Cool. And then the other thing some of you have been doing is that you want to turn off the player, right? So that um, you can't just keep wandering around after the game's over. And so again, race timer. Um, let's see here. On our player object, or on the player rather, um, player movement script. I think we can just disable that. So race timer, another one here. Right, so again, this you, you can write code that does all of this stuff as well, right? I could just do it all in C sharp. But just setting up an event, because you can do so much in Unity, just sort of just like turning things on and off at different times. And so um, just setting things up like this works, this makes it much more flexible. And so here we want to go to the player movement advanced and then essentially turn that off. 
And so now we'll save and run it again. can still rotate but I can't move. What we would need to turn off. The rotation is not coming from the animation, it's coming from the the script. But it is it's slightly more complicated than that. So the maybe if we disable the orientation object. So race timer, one more. We'll also take our orientation and uh, turn that off. Let's see, that may definitely throw an error. Maybe we'll get lucky. I'm not entirely sure how that's gonna cascade through the system. I'm not sure. I'd have to do some research to see what's going on with that. But at least it freezes us at that point. Cool. Okay. I think this makes the game, because I feel like everyone's making some pretty good strides in terms of the visual design. But I don't think that has been quite as much thought about the level the level design as far as the progression of the difficulty and then also the um, uh, amount of this adds you know this hard limit that you need to have in order to uh, get it done within a certain amount of time as I was thinking about making this change what would be um, now that time is a resource, what would be a good power up for the player? Uh, bonus time. Bonus time, right. Um, how would we do bonus time? We would need to just simply add to this variable, right? If timer time got more, um, if, if the number just went up, then we, we get bonus time. Um, we would need, and it'd be great to be able to access that in an event. Uh, in order to do that, we need a public function. And so we'll say add to time. We'll call it that. And um, we'll make a variable up here, public float. And this will be bonus time amount uh, equals 10 for now, right? So if you get, get this power up, you get 10 seconds, right? Um, and down here, we'll say timer time. You could do, you could, the long way to write it out would be timer time equals timer time plus bonus time amount, right? So this line is equal to this syntax as well. Plus equals uh, bonus time amount. Okay, so both these things mean the same thing. This is the one that makes more sense in terms of you know, algebra class, but this one is the same thing. Just you have to do this a lot in computer code, just increment and decrement that variables, hence the shorthand way of doing it. So um, we'll just comment that one out and leave the other one. And so now we just simply, we need to make a, a, a thing, a power-up, that gives you more time. 
And so if we come in here to, let's just make a sphere. And it needs to be something that we can run into. And we know that we ran into it. So we'll make it a trigger. And then we'll use that on trigger event tag because we don't want the power the power up to go away if it gets hit by a cannonball. We only want the power up to go away if it gets hit hits by the player. And so here we need to make sure is our player tag is capital P. I should really fix that in the default of the script. Um, but for the time being, capital P player. There we go. And we need to send an event. We need to send the event to the race timer. Send the event to the race timer. And since I did that public function, it should appear in here. We go to race timer and then add to time, right? It shows up here because I made that function public. And so when we hit the sphere, we should get 10 seconds. Let's test it. So you could use these as kind of like, um, you know, bonuses and um, kind of like checkpoints, right? If you make it that far, you know, you got to get to the next one. So the, um, there we go. We started that and now, uh, nope, why did that not work? I have this trigger selected. Does it not have a collider on it? Oh, it has a collider on it. It's is trigger, on trigger, event, trigger object player. Capsule collider, player, player, race timer, add to time. Let's double check here. Well, it didn't even, uh, right, okay. Wait, 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 I was expecting it to go away. I didn't do that. Um, did you guys notice? Did the time go up? Yeah, the timer went up by 10 seconds. So okay. Just, every time you bumped into it, it just added on 10 more seconds. Oh, uh, okay. Um, right, because it's on trigger enter, right? So uh, so here starts, right? Okay, there we go. So it went up, and then if I came back, yeah, it keeps going up. So that's obviously, we don't want that. We want it to, you just want to be able to get it once. So I believe we can do this. Um, on trigger event enter, we turn, we first give ourselves 10 seconds, then we turn ourselves off. Game object, uh, not is static, um, set active, off. I believe these execute in this order. Let's test that. So now, Clock. And there we go. And it's not there anymore, so I can't re-trigger it. Cool. Mission accomplished. Okay, excellent. So now, um, great, we'll implement those, right? And so the, the bigger overarching thing here is reconsider your level design now that we have this mechanism here, right? That you've got to, um, you know, you could start the time, you need to make some decisions there. Do you want to put enough time on the clock at the beginning that the bonus time is really bonus time? Or do you want to put, you know, just slowly dole out the time as you try to hit each section, right? If you did that, it would put more pressure on the player to clear each section more quickly, right? If you make a bigger amount of time at the very beginning, then that gives the player a little bit more freedom to sort of dilly-dally at the beginning and then try and speed up at the end, right? Um, so that's the decision you would need to make as the designer there. How, how do you want to orchestrate the 
ups and downs of you know the impetus to keep moving forward as quickly as possible in the game and we can do all the usual things with these triggers right when the game's over uh, when we run out of time we can do our music switch turn off the happy music turn on the sad music um, We'll have to look at it. There's probably something we could do. I'd have to think about what that looks like. But the um, the music has a playback speed that we could turn up as time goes down. Um, you know, increasing the uh, level of tension in the whole thing. If we had certain, um, yeah, 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 event triggers that could be calculated either based on um, just absolute amount of time, like at five seconds or ten seconds, or um, like proportional amounts of time, like if you're down below. You, know, you couldn't do well. You could do proportional based on the starting amount. Like yeah, yeah. You could have you know like particle effects or that like the glow getting higher. As the time runs down, and you know, and uh, your character's having a migraine or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, all sorts of things that you could trigger as time runs out there. Okay, cool. We got a lot of new stuff that we'll look at there. Sound good, Brendan? Are you getting? Are you on track to get caught up over the weekend? You were getting closer, right? Did you did you build it and put it on itch yet? Okay, yeah, get that up so that we you know so that it's playable, playable. Cool. All right. Um, all right. I'll put up the assignment here in a little bit. Super. Okay. Let's call it there. Did you come into work or just for the night class? Um, well, so I'm in FMP. The, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but my computer uh, is. Mm -hmm. So I took it into Assyria. Um, mm -hmm. The whole story of it is, is that there was like a storm going on one night when we were doing the tracking project. And I was trying to render out the last bit of it. The storm wasn't doing too good with it. So I was like, okay, I'm going to take it to a pop shop work out there. I took it there. The computer got a little hot. So I was like, okay, cool. I'm going to save everything. I'm going to head back and so I'll just upload it because the storm died down a bit. Um, and then it did a constant rebooting thing. Uh, and I was like, oh no, oh god. Cool. So that's when I sent the thing. I'm like, oh, I'm, that's like, I've been spending a long time trying to get this thing back up and going. So I um, spent the next day trying to work it. I left it alone for a bit. Still was doing the rebooting thing. So uh -huh. I called my insurance company. I took it over to Shoyan Tech Repair. And they were like, okay, well, Easter's coming up, but we should have this done by like, boom, we'll put in new operation software. And I was like, okay, cool. So, um, they said that they had issues uh, in getting it going, and that it did a 15 minute like thing where it was accessible, and then it did the restart cycle again. So I was like, okay, there's a bigger problem. And then Easter happened, and then just yesterday they were telling me like, okay, well the hard drive's out, uh, and the motherboard's melted. So, it's gonna be in by next Wednesday. So <laughs> I've been on. Uh, did you ask about borrowing a computer from school? I came in today to work with that. And then I was going around to all these computers seeing if there was like a Cinema 4D that uh, would work. Because um, I'm in driving distance now. Uh, I'm like the Yeah, I mean, Cinema's on all these computers in this room. Yeah. Um, I tried it on that one, and it was saying that it had an, um, it needed the Maxon app updated. Yeah, but you're going to want to transfer it. Yeah. It's so little. Yeah. And Adobe After Effects on here. Yeah, it's 22, but they said they haven't updated it. Yeah, it's, it's not following my class. Yeah. Um, oh, right, so it won't even open it? No, but I can I can restart that whole thing that I was working on um, over the next few days, or I can wait till Wednesday. And then you have your data, yeah? Or uh, they weren't okay. able to back up everything, but on this hard drive, so I'll have to reinstall Maxon, and I'll have to reinstall it, and I'll have to switch to the old version. 
Yeah, yeah, like that. Oh, no, cut that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sweet, like that's not like a one-time thing. Like, it's, it's, you can play it on many computers. It's fine. You just don't need to watch it. Okay. Then that works well. Because then, uh, sweet. So then I can install it. Alright. Um, this has, uh, all of my, um, my project on it. Okay. Yeah. For, uh, both FMV and, uh, 2D. Two and seven. Yeah. Yeah, I'll watch. So yeah, I'm I'm in here teaching all day on Mondays and Wednesdays. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so anytime you want to be in here on those days is fine. Uh, the schedule, I don't know what the schedule is in here. I know I'm gonna get like six classes out of the five for the past five weeks. Yeah, so the, the only computers we have at school that are completely able to do all the stuff are just the ones here. I don't think any of the ones out there are... They have uh, Adobe products, um, oh, yeah, but Adobe. it's out. Yeah. By, and they don't have the Crunchy, because when I uh, yeah. I put in this out there, and it was able to run it because it was up to date, but it didn't have any of the Crunchy yeah. effects, so all my tracking stuff went... Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, the, the camera tracking. Yeah. That, that should... The optical blow that you know. Yeah. Oh, I can't get into the optical. Um, yeah, now that I'm driving distance, um, I get off work at 1 tomorrow. Is this uh, is this open? I don't know. Um, I'll have to look. I'll be here. I'm not, I'm usually not here on Thursdays, but I'll be here tomorrow morning, and I'll try to find out what the, the schedule is. Um, yeah, Monday, Wednesday, Anytime. Like, I'm, I'm you're here, like, I know you're busy. <laughs> yeah, like, dude. Because there's not a whole lot of people that are in person right now. So, um, I'm not sure. Uh, the, yeah, and it's all recently updated. Yeah. Like, the GPU and stuff. Um, I need to run it with this, because, like, my computer on that last little bit, this, <laughs> this wouldn't be ever. Yeah. I just wanted to like uh, let you know because yeah, yeah yeah no I, I understand the I mean at least it was insured and everything yeah that that was getting me I just got I just uh oh I've been out of a car for like the last six months and I just got one because I moved uh -huh. uh, and uh, of course something else has to go you know <laughs> is it the computer warranty or do you have like an insurance oh, policy oh no the computer warranty died a while ago but um I'm on my dad's tech insurance and uh, he got it he got it a year ago because my sister uh, my two sisters were playing karaoke at the house and uh, she uh, was singing with a ladle and threw it through the TV <laughs> so <laughs> they dropped like four grand to get a new TV that they couldn't afford oh no, my god so like, oh, we'll just get some tech insurance Yeah. All right. Tech guys I was talking to was like they don't they don't seem happy about this insurance. Yeah, I mean the that. Um, yeah, overheating. That's usually the thing. Oh, that was the other thing. Wanted. Is there? Um, I started implementing more of the cash clearing, uh, and then I'm buying a fan to go underneath it. Uh -huh. I had that on top of like uh, my, my like desk before. Uh, is there anything that I could do, do you think, 
maybe for the computer. Because I'll work on it like maybe three hours at a time, and then I'll put it into like, I'll close the application, I'll put it into sleep mode, and then I'll return to it like an hour later and be like, all right, boom, back into the project that I was working on. You know, like workflow wise, it gives it like a good incremental thing, but at the same time, I don't want to. Yeah, it, no, it's just. Um there's something wrong with the parts. They, they um, there's supposed to be two fail safes. Like one, the fans kick on. Yeah. Like the computer knows how hot it is. There's yeah. like you know, like everything's in it. And then two, if it gets too hot, it just, um, I mean, unless it's severely flawed, it just turns off. Yeah. Um, so. It was doing both yeah, yeah. So I mean, both those things, okay. you know, should not be happening in terms of like, you know. Running it cooler. I mean, I don't know. Like may, like maybe the laptop game. fan, but you know, laptops are like. You know, I, I think the cooling is not. It's not the same. No, I was like it's, it's a building. much dicier situation than like a big box with fans in it. Yeah. But having this, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm excited to. Because um, now that I got the car, I'm like, all right, I can start shifting more money towards. Yeah, I mean the the parts. Well, I mean you should be able to get parts pretty reasonably now. Oh yeah, especially if I get like last year's parts because you know they depreciate value like, really fast. Yeah, you could probably get like a twenty eighty now for like you know six hundred bucks or something. Yeah. You know. All right, I'll be back. I'm just gonna grab something real quick. No more class sets. Trinity should be here in a second. She needs to go here in front.
block out part of this building, there's one right across the street. Oh. Or if you keep walking that way, there's like one a little bit down further that way. I'm not sure if they're full though. Yeah. Crowded in here, jeez. <laughs> 